What's up Lazy Dog fam? Hope everybody out there is having an awesome day. It feels like an awesome day here. It feels like fall, even though fall's probably really still another month or so away. But we're getting down into the 60s this weekend. Might even get down to the 60s tonight. So definitely feels good out here. Not near as humid. Got a little breeze going. So it's a good day to try to stick with our fall seed starting schedule i'm a little late i think today's the second of september and i was aiming for the end of august to get my cool season stuff started my collars broccoli cauliflower rutabagas a lot of that good stuff so we're going to be getting in the greenhouse in a little bit we're going to be getting some of those seeds started in trays but i have one tray in there that we already planted on a previous video and those plants are up i'll show you in a minute of um, those are flowers that we have planted and I need to fertilize those guys now I haven't gotten a water spigot or water line ran to my greenhouse yet but I'm planning on doing that very soon when I do that I'm probably gonna be doing my fertilizing with this little hose on siphon mixer here which works really good problem with this is this only works for short hoses I think maybe the hose length restriction maybe uh, like 25 feet or so so it won't work with a really long garden hose definitely won't work with a drip irrigation system and it's more than 25 feet from here where I'm at the well on around there to the greenhouse so I can't use this until I get a spigot in the greenhouse so until then we're gonna use the spray bottle here to fertilize our transplants now this may not be ideal if you had a ton of them to do but we just got one tray that needs fertilizing right now so i think this is going to work now in the past i have used 20 20 20 a good bit to fertilize seedlings and that works really well but we're going to try using some of this agro thrive stuff here to fertilize our seedlings and I mentioned this on a previous video when we were discussing the agar thrive. This stuff is made with corn steep liquor and fish emulsion, but the way they make it, it's a lot more biologically active and it acts a lot quicker than standard fish emulsion or other organic products. So I'm hoping because this stuff is a little more active that it actually works on the seedlings. Sometimes organic fertilizers don't work really well on transplants because they take too long to break down and little seedlings or transplants, they need it right then because they have a pretty short grow out time. You know, they're only in the greenhouse for four to six weeks or so. So we're gonna try this and see how this works on our seedlings. The guy at AgriThrive said they have a lot of commercial guys over there in California using this on transplants and seedlings, that it works really well and that it helps the transplant not have hardly any transplant shock when you put it in the ground. So we shall see or not whether that works for us. So I've got this little spray bottle here. If I can hold on to it. And let me shake this up a little bit first. With this stuff, we don't have to worry about burning the plants as much as we would some 20-20-20. 20-20-20 on seedlings, you got to be pretty careful there. You get it too hot, you can burn them and lose a whole tray. So I'm just going to go with, I don't know, a tablespoon or two here we're gonna put it in this little sprayer and then add water to it and spray it on our plants now this stuff will work better as a drench when you're chasing it with a good bit of water as opposed to just spraying it on but what we'll do is we'll spray it and then as we water the tray it should get drenched into the soil there where it needs to be to really feed these transplants. And there we go, we got us a nice little concoction here. And I should mention the reason we have to fertilize seedlings is because the seed starting mix we use is sterile. So we wanna use a sterile, sterile seed starting mix, one that doesn't have any weed seeds in it, one that doesn't have any um, bacteria or fungi or diseases in it. We want it to be sterile so those transplants will be healthy and we're not transferring anything from the greenhouse to our garden. But because it's sterile, it doesn't really have any nutrients. So we gotta add some nutrients to it and hopefully this is gonna work. Let's go to the greenhouse and see what's going on in there. All right, so in here we have 
this planted so far now these speckled swan gourds i must have got some bad seed because i've waited and waited on these guys i did have one pop up there after about two weeks but uh just some dud seeds i guess we're gonna try again uh with a different kind of gourd i bought some more gourd seeds so we'll try again there uh, maybe gourd seeds are tough to germinate i've never started them in the greenhouse like this but that is a scratch so we'll dump those might save that one little plant there stick it somewhere here's our flower seeds we got pretty good germination on these guys so we got our giant marigolds here on the end those come up pretty well those were the fastest to germinate calendula came up okay i don't always get the greatest germination with calendula but decent enough i'll have enough plants there for what we're going to do um the centauria the bachelor button it's coming up the snapdragon i was worried about it it was the last to come up and those seeds were tiny and the seedlings are tiny tiny as you can see there but we are starting to get some germination there so some of these will be coming out of the tray sooner than others we'll plant directly out of this tray but it looks like those marigolds will be ready to go a lot sooner than some of the rest of these here here we've got my trays laid out this is what we're going to try to plant today five trays worth over here on the other side here's our popcorn that's been drying we'll show you this on an upcoming video hopefully but we just uh we've been popping some trying to pop some about every day and uh, brooklyn popped some yesterday and it was perfect so i need to get this in an airtight container or get it in the freezer so i can get my um or until i can get my corn shiller ready but this stuff right here is pop ready so i need to get it out of the greenhouse still got our okri pods drying over here for seed most of those are dried out and then back over here on the other side of the corn we've got our seeds laid out that we're going to plant today and i've kind of stacked them uh based on what's going to all go in the same tray so i got five trays over there i've got five stacks of seed right here so should work out we'll see so before we plant more seeds let's go ahead and fertilize these guys and i don't know maybe i can get this to actually spray instead of just squirting like that i don't know maybe i just have to do it like this this is not the most ideal way to do it but i think it'll work i thought this thing would spray i don't really know how to adjust it anyway we'll get enough on there and then we'll chase it with some water get it incorporated into the soil there leave that there i might need that later and we'll chase it down with a little water here and make sure that any of that fertilizer residue is sitting on those leaves so it doesn't burn them and also get that fertilizer down there in the soil a little bit that should be good enough and now we got that fertilized it's time to start some more stuff now when i'm starting multiple trays like this because i can tend to make a mess in here what i like to do is just line them up tight side by side and it makes it easier i can fill them all at one time instead of filling one individually i can just put a lot of seed start mix up here kind of massage it all in the trays at one time and not make this much of a mess so let's get at it the devil can We got our trays filled we got them nice and watered down here this seed starting mix is super super dry it's dry anyways it's especially dry when it's been sitting in this greenhouse you got to wet this stuff really good to get seeds to germinate it can hold a lot of moisture initially and i have seen the case where people wonder why their seeds don't germinate and they start digging around in there and they find that the bottom of that cell is just powder dry so you got to get water all the way through that cell there to get a moist environment for that seed to germinate also if you're um once your seeds do germinate when you water you got to make sure you water till water runs through the bottom of these so you're getting water down to the bottom of that cell 
getting water to those plant roots otherwise your seedlings might die so it takes a good bit of water initially but they do hold water pretty good once you get everything wet the perlite in there kind of helps out with that so we got our five trays here let's start planting okay so tray number one is going to get pak choy and some mustard a variety called savannah mustard that i really like i've grown a lot before and most of the other trays are getting more than two things but these are two crops that we like to plant pretty close pretty dense and so we need a lot more plants to end up with a full row in any of our plots so um, because we can plant these thicker because we'll be putting more plants in we're just going to go with two different varieties or crops in this tray so i got my labels right here and someone i can't remember if it was on instagram facebook or whatever asked me to talk about plant spacing with all this cool season stuff so we'll try to cover that a little bit as we go through and plant this stuff now um on the savannah mustard you can go out and direct seed that real dense like you would a bed of cut and come again greens this seed right here no matter where you get it from i got this from harris seeds it's pretty pricey and so that's why i'm going to transplant it so we're going to grow out the transplants and then we'll put these transplants these mustard transplants we'll put them i'd say about four inches apart three to four inches apart pretty close together there and i know it's unusual to transplant mustard most people always direct seed mustard because it comes up so well but with these seeds they're a little more pricey we want to be careful with them and so we're going to transplant so this savannah mustard here we can get multiple multiple cuttings off this as long as we don't cut it back too far we can cut it and it'll grow back and from my experiences this is the fastest growing green there is out there this stuff grows so fast you'll have food to eat and if you direct seed it in 20 days sometimes definitely in 30 days it is so fast to grow i got a decent amount of seed here i went with the uh somewhat of a bulk discount there and we can succession plant these we can um you know if some of them do bolt or start looking scraggly we can plant another round i just wanted to have plenty of these seeds around because we'll likely try to keep this stuff in the garden you know from now on through early spring maybe it's just really really good stuff to eat and then on the pack choy here we're doing a variety called joy choy which i have grown before does really well now you can plant pack choy real dense and do like a cut and come again with it or you can grow it out in full size heads and that's usually what we do but you can usually fit this stuff a little tighter in the row than you can something like lettuce or collards or broccoli I'd say you can pack it in there with about a six to eight inch spacing kind of grow some you know baby to full size heads of it this stuff right here is really really tender it's fast to grow as well and if you've never grown pack choy man it's really really good stuff it um it cooks up in no time because it's so tender you just uh kind of cut it cut the base off of it rinse it off a little bit throw it in a big stir fry pot and you've got a meal real quick now we're just going to top our seeds with the perlite here not too much we still want to be able to see those kind of divisions between the cells there just in case we need to do any thinning we accidentally drop more than one seed if we do need to thin them out we can tell where the boundaries of the cells are so it makes our thinning a lot easier There we go. And I'll water all these in at one time when we're done here. So one tray out of the way, four more to go. And for tray number two here, we're going in with some rutabaga and then our standard cabbages. When I say standard, just your regular old green and red cabbage. We've got some Napa cabbage and that kind of stuff, some Savoy cabbage, but these are just kind of your basic cabbages. So we're gonna do the um, rutabagas on one half of the tray and then we'll do the cabbages on the other half of the tray here so for the rutabagas we've got kind of a standard old school variety and then we've got a hybrid variety I've never tried before the kind of standard variety is the um, American purple top I've also grown a variety in the past called Laurentian 
it did pretty good so we're going to compare this American purple top to this other hybrid we've got here and see how they compare our rutabagas is really fun thing to grow you don't have to transplant them I like to transplant them because they get more consistent root size I also like to crop some of the leaves as they grow that seems to devote more energy into the root there and we make a bigger rutabaga and those greens are really tasty so we eat those as well while we're waiting on the rutabaga roots to get big and the hybrid rutabaga variety we've got here is called Helenor maybe the H is silent I don't know but uh, we're gonna give it a try see how it does never grown this one before but I always like comparing open pollinated or heirloom varieties versus the hybrids really see the difference in them sometimes you can see some big differences sometimes you can't you know I noticed that with the um, that Costata Romanesca squash that we grew as a succession planting kind of late spring early summer that the hybrid Costata Romanesca really blew the doors off the open pollinated version you don't always see that but um, sometimes you do and if it's not something where you're really worried about saving the seeds I always say go with the hybrid for the extra production if you're not trying to save the seeds and then on the standard cabbage here we've got a red variety called Ruby Perfection which I haven't grown before and then we've got a green variety called Capture that I haven't grown before but I've heard good things about it so I'm really excited about the Capture trying that up to this date my favorite green variety of cabbage or the best one that's done well for me is one called cheers it's a really really good variety but um, I've just kind of been testing out a bunch of different ones lately to see if I could find one that does as good as cheers I haven't had any luck yet but um, I just like trying all these varieties and comparing them seeing what works well that way we can share it with you guys and you can grow some of these that do do well for us now I mentioned on the mustard and the pak choy that we're going to put those pretty dense along the road for the cabbage the rutabagas and the majority of the other stuff we're planting today i'm going with a one foot spacing so we'll um just lay out our drip tape barrier drip tape there the emitters are one foot apart there we'll just put a transplant on top of every emitter especially with the cabbage some people say they plant cabbage on 18 inch spacing and some of the ones that heads that get real big you probably need that but I've always done fine with one foot spacing on cabbage. For the rutabagas, you can pack those in there a little tighter. I'd say you could go eight inches if you wanted to, but just to be safe, because we want the greens to get nice and big, we're gonna go with the 12 inch spacing tool on the rutabagas. Now I have planted the rutabagas on double rows before and did okay, but we're not selling rutabagas anymore, so I don't really need that maximal production, so I'll probably just do those on single rows but I'll do those on 12 inch spacing just like the cabbage. And on our third tray here, we're going kale and collards, our home run producers of the fall slash winter garden. So we wanna make sure we got plenty of those. Everybody loves those, they're great to share. And when it comes Thanksgiving or holiday time, everybody wants to know if we got any collards they can have. So we wanna have plenty of kale and collards to share. So on the kale, I always like to grow a lacinato type or like the dinosaur kale and then always one that has kind of the frilly leaves on it always like to plant one of each for the lacinato type one i have here is called black magic which i haven't tried before i think maybe it's called that because the leaves are a little darker than a standard lacinato now we didn't have great luck with our lacinato kale this last year it bolted just like our collars did in early spring it struck off like 80 degrees unusually late winter early spring and all of it bolted except for that blue ridge kale that we have out there now but um hopefully that won't happen this year and we can keep most of our collars and kale in the garden for a longer time for the frilly kale this year i'm growing one called darker boar and i've always wanted to try it but johnny seems like they're always out of it so I did find some from Harris Seeds. The seeds are treated, but that'll be all right because I really wanted to try this variety and compare it to some of the other kind of 
Freely kale varieties I've grown in the past. I'm sure there's a more technical name than Freely, but that's just terminology I use. Mm -hmm. And then the third kale, a new one we're adding to the rotation this year, is called Vieira. Maybe that's how you pronounce it. But it's a Portuguese kale. I've never grown Portuguese kale. The pictures, it looks a lot like collards. They say it kind of tastes like collards. We're going to try the Portuguese kale. See how it does for us. The pictures, like I said, look really, really tasty. We'll just have to see how it does. But I think it's going to be fun to try either way. And then on the collards here, we've got Flash and Champion. Neither of which I have grown before. My favorite variety of collards that I've ever grown was a variety called Tiger. And it was discontinued by the breeder for variety called Top Bunch 2.0 and Top Bunch 2.0 does all right but it it's nothing like Tiger was in my opinion it um, the, the Tiger just holds better had, had a better bolting tolerance to it just produced better the Top Bunch 2.0 is a decent variety but I guess I just had really high expectations for it because they replaced such a good variety with it and I was let down a little bit so we're going to try these Flash and Champion collars here and see if we can't find something that's a little more close to that Tiger variety we like so much. Okay, tray number three is done. Now for tray number four or five. So tray number four here is getting broccoli and let's see what else. Brussels sprouts. So we'll get our tags in here. Now... When I'm mixing stuff like this and not doing a whole flat of just one thing, if I'm mixing crops in a tray, I try to at least plant things that are gonna grow at relatively the same rate. Just like the pak choy and the mustard, they both grow really fast, so I put those together. The broccoli and the Brussels sprouts transplants, cabbage, things like that will grow the same together or grow at a pretty similar rate. Same thing with the kale and collards last thing you want to do is put something in here that's going to grow up and kind of outcompete everything else lettuce usually grows really fast lettuce transplants do so that when i do lettuce transplants i just put lettuce in there because they'll get big and they'll smother out some of the slower germinating stuff so consider that if you're mixing a bunch of stuff in a tray if you have no other choice if you only have one tray to work with you might consider skipping over a sale to give something room or just plant similar crops in the same tray so that nothing shades anything out until the transplants are ready to go in the ground. Now on the broccoli here we've got my favorite variety the one that does the best for us down here in the south and that's Green Magic. It does really well. It can be planted early because it can take some of the heat early on. just really like this variety. Even some of the commercial guys around here grow this variety. And I'm growing more broccoli than we need to grow here because I've got some friends and family that have requested some extra transplants. So we're going to grow out a few extra so we can share the love of the new greenhouse here. Another broccoli variety I've got here is called Jacaranda. And this is supposed to be a purple broccoli, which I've never, don't know that I've ever seen a purple broccoli. But we're going to give it a go, see how it does. And then the old dreaded Brussels sprouts. Man, they're so good to eat, but they are so hard to grow for me. We'll get them by a good crop of them about once every two or three years. It's always worth a try because it's like one of those things you just you can't let it whoop you. You got to keep trying at it, and when you do succeed, it is definitely worth it. I've tried all kind of different tactics. May try some different tactics this year that I haven't tried before. We're just going to keep trying away at it until we get it just right. A lot of it has to do with weather. Sometimes it doesn't get cold enough down here for these things to really do well. And I see on Facebook these pictures of these huge Brussels sprout fields where they're just stalks three, four foot tall and stuff. And I am completely jealous, but not a whole lot I can do about it. And as far as the plant spacing on the broccoli and the Brussels sprouts go, same thing with the cabbage. 
one foot apart we'll put one transplant on each emitter and that usually works out pretty good I have tried doing double rows of broccoli before and it didn't work well at all there's just not enough room there most of the time our broccoli plants get pretty dang big so I haven't had good luck with double rows on there we stick to single rows plants 12 inches apart and the last tray here is getting cauliflower and some of the more specialty cabbage the savoy cabbage and also the chinese or the napa cabbage looking forward to making some more kimchi when those get ready so we're going to get our tabs in here so we can remember what we planted so on the cauliflower we're planting a variety called amazing which is a white cauliflower i've grown it before it does pretty well so trying that one again usually i grow some purple cauliflower but uh i didn't get any seeds for that yet this year Sometimes it does really well, sometimes it does, it's kind of hit or miss, so I decided to go with this amazing variety, which I know does well. And then we've also got something here that I don't know anything about, which is a Romanesco type cauliflower. We'll just see how that goes. I saw it when I was looking for seeds online and said, hey, we'll give that a try. And on the specialty cabbage, for the Chinese cabbage, we're going with a variety called Suzuko. Never tried it before. And then on the Savoy cabbage, going with a variety called Savoy Perfection. I haven't grown that one before either. I've grown Savoy King, and that one's a pretty good Savoy cabbage. I never tried Savoy Perfection, so we're going to see just how perfect it is. All right, all right, all right. That's tray five of five done. Now, anytime we're doing seed starts, somebody always asks, why are we putting this white stuff, or what is this white stuff? So, we top all our seeds with perlite as opposed to more seed starting mix. Reasons we do it, it helps with aeration. Seems like we get pretty good germination, faster germination. Um, the seeds don't get waterlogged. They stay in a nice moist environment, but not too wet with the perlite covering them. Also helps us from getting a kind of an algal crust buildup on top of the soil when we do start fertilizing them a little bit. Some people say it helps with fungus gnats. And we got plenty of gnats down here, but I don't know that I've ever seen any fungus gnats. Maybe you can't see them. I don't know. But I've also heard that's a benefit of using the perlite. Some people swear by using vermiculite to top as opposed to perlite. We like the perlite. So that's the reason we top with this stuff. You can get a big bag of this stuff cheap on Amazon last year a long long time and that might not look like much now folks but that's a lot of groceries that's gonna come out of these five trays right here and we still got plenty of room in the greenhouse to play with especially when we get our popcorn out of the way let me get these watered in and uh, we'll go from there now with every growing situation or every new growing situation there's a bit of a learning curve so you can have the exact same greenhouse in the exact same county with the exact same you know weather conditions and the amount you need to water stuff can be different now this greenhouse my greenhouse is in a spot that gets a little bit of afternoon shade late late in the afternoon so i've only been having to water these things twice a day i come out here in the morning after i drop abram off at of school and then usually around five or six o'clock in the afternoon I'll come out here and water them again and I haven't noticed anything being too dry or anything suffering so twice a day has been good for me but I have seen situations where folks have to water three or four times a day just depending on where the greenhouse is at how much sun it's getting throughout the entire day but here twice a day it's been nice and I just realized something we were talking about fertilizing seedlings but I didn't tell you when we like to start and with what frequency now these flower seedlings from my experiences aren't quite as hungry as some of those vegetable seedlings will be over there but we look here we're going to wait till they get their second set of leaves or what we call the true leaves so that would be the first leaf that's the second leaf or the first true leaf so once they start putting on true leaves that's when we want to start fertilizing we want to do it at least once a week maybe sometimes twice a week just have to kind of look at them and see how healthy they are but I'd say two times a week is a good schedule for fertilizing seedlings like this. All right, so that's all the work we need to do in the greenhouse today. Now let's head over to the sweet potato patch where we need to get some of these sweet taters ready to dig this weekend while it's still cool. Now based on the published date of the video when I planted these, these are about at 
90 to 100 days, if not closer to 100 days. So they should be ready to dig. And we've scratched a little bit and they seem ready to dig. Now, it's hard to tell where one variety ends and another one starts, but I can kind of tell where my heels are at there. And that's why I put them on heels or one of the reasons why I put them on heels so I can kind of tell the difference between these varieties. So there's a heel, there's a heel, there's two more heels there. Now that experimental variety from NC State over there, we're gonna leave it for a little while, but we're about to start getting after some of these, probably digging a row every few days or so. Now, if you've ever dug sweet potatoes before, you know that when you're digging these things, you spend more time clearing these vines or fighting these vines than you do actually digging the sweet potatoes. The vine part is more time consuming than the digging part is. So clearing the vines out of the way before you dig is a good idea because it saves you on time. But a few years ago, my buddies at Steel Plant Company, where I got most of these sweet potato slips, told me that if you go in there and you mow the vines down about, I think they said three days or so, about three days, give or take a day or two, before you go to dig them, it will actually toughen the skins up a little bit and make them not bruise as much when you're harvesting them. You know, you're digging these things, it's hot outside, you're throwing them in the bucket, you don't want them to be all skin up. So it'll toughen the skins a little bit. So that's what we're gonna do. However, since I'm on heels here, I can't really come in here with my lawnmower because I'll just be scalping all my sweet potatoes over the top of that hill. So I'm gonna go grab my weed eater and we're just gonna weed eat one row. We're gonna start on the end here with these Georgia Jets. We're gonna try, we'll see if the weed eater works. It should work. We're gonna weed eat, clear these vines, chop up these vines on these Georgia Jets here so then we can dig them in three days or so, maybe this weekend when it's nice and cool out here still. Well, that actually worked pretty good. It started raining on me, so I had to get the camera out of there. I was going to show you guys a close-up. It didn't get it as close as if I would have mowed it, but close enough to uh, get all those vines out of the way and dig those guys in a few days. A weed eater worked like a charm. I would say that didn't take about three minutes to knock that out real quick like, so I like that technique. By the time I would have went and got the lawnmower, I was already done with the weed eater, so good call there. So I'm sure you can hear the rain coming down now. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thanks for joining me in the greenhouse, getting those sweet potatoes ready. If you did enjoy this video, make sure to subscribe, ring the bell, like, and share. And we'll see you next time right here at Lazy Dog Farm. Oh, well. Mm -hmm. By the beauty of your life.